What is up, everyone? Welcome to episode 132 of the Untitled Movie Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Matt Rohrbeck, alongside. He's allergic to tomatoes, but he is tomato meter approved. Eric Marchin. Matt, I thought you were going to say we come back or we come back. <laughs> God. Uh, yeah, today is going to be it's going to be a chill episode. Eric and I are probably a little a little sleepy boys. We're a little uh, a little tired and uh, uh, worn down. But today is going to be our uh, 132 is our TIFF 2022 uh, wrap up episode. The good, the bad and the Bulgari, the Bulgari. Eric. <laughs> The Bulgari. So people probably uh, heard that little intro music that I used. If you didn't go to TIFF this year, um, if you did go, that's probably etched in your brain. If you didn't go, it's you can Google, you can YouTube this. It's the Paulo Sorrentino uh, Unexpected Wonders Bulgari campaign commercial. Uh, there's a short 15 second version, which is more of the version we saw at TIFF 30 times. Um, but then there's a long, longer director's cut, Eric, if you wanted to go watch no. it. Cause I, <laughs> so, um, yeah, today's going to be our TIFF wrap up episode. Uh, we did do a bunch of reviews from the festival. So please go check those out over on untitled movie reviews. We reviewed the Fablemans. We reviewed glass onion. We reviewed weird. We reviewed bros brother, um, a uh, ton of stuff. So, Go check out uh, Untitled Movie Reviews for all of our TIFF reviews, and we'll also be kind of trickling out um, even more for the next two-plus weeks. You'll probably get a review every day, every other day kind of thing of, of maybe a couple per day or something like that uh, of TIFF reviews because um, we got out all the big stuff during the festival, but then we wanted to kind of you know save our energy, record with the good microphones, uh, record with the good video, for YouTube and stuff like that. So we decided to kind of hold off and trickle out all of our TIFF reviews over the next couple of weeks. But this episode, we'll be covering everything. Uh, our best films of the fest, our, the worst films of the fest, um, what we kind of, you know, did and hung out and ate and how the festival was and how Festival Street was, how the venues were, all that kind of stuff. Basically, our entire uh, TIFF experience is what this uh, episode will be. So uh, we're just going to hang out and talk TIFF. So Eric, how are you feeling? Drained, Matt, but not in a kind of way that you're completely like burnt out after having spent two full weeks watching movies, more in a kind of like, you know, you're slowly starting to recharge and decompress after watching, you know, a lot of movies, but also doing a lot of recording, getting a few hours sleep per night, um, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a whole night um, during the festival, you know, you want to take advantage of that. Um, but yeah, I, I would say in good spirits overall and just kind of, again, getting back to a regular routine, both body and mind. Um, you know, we ate a lot of crap, uh, during the festival, but we had moments where we were eating some stuff. Had a that vegetable actually, or two. Yeah. Yeah. It was green and not in a gone off kind of way. Although we did pass this thing of macaroni on the God hot sidewalk a couple of weeks, <laughs> for, yeah. you know, like a couple times during those two weeks. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of stuff like that where, you know, you're always moving, you're always doing something. I think we got in more, steps as well within that i did in the last weeks. year yeah it was it's so interesting because this is probably the most i've you know i also had like a family feud canada dinner i went to last night we also had some screenings before the festival and some events and stuff like that so this is the most stuff i have done in consecutive days for like the last three years right so like i'm both i i feel you where i'm both worn down like especially uh, you know, Sunday getting home and and Monday taking the day off for the most part. Um, but I was saying this on Cinema Scene, which you guys should be able to check out soon later in later in the month or early October. Um, but uh, I, I'm still riding that high because we haven't really. We're both wearing our. I'm wearing my Tiff badge. I don't oh, know let me put mine off, back but, on. Hold on. Um, I put it on for this episode, but and the Cinema Scene episode. But I'm still riding that high of like we hadn't had a full festival for three years or so uh or two years so like i'm still kind of riding that high of like being excited for it and I, I didn't feel that burnout that i usually do by like wednesday of the festival where i'm like i don't want to see another movie or i don't want to see another movie for the next like month or two um i think we did a good job of like spreading out our screenings like we did some pre-festival stuff and then we did like two to three per day and ended up 
doing like i think you did seven movies before the festival and 30 during the festival or something around that like maybe or or nine before the festival and 30 during where i did about seven before and about 25 during or something that 26 during so like it was that two to three a day that i think that was that sweet spot and then we we kind of squeezed in those on the fly recordings and food and uh it was still like non-stop but um it was a good time saw people we haven't seen in a long time uh chatted with a ton of people um saw that eric mentioned earlier this this poster for this movie called we that it just looks like this <laughs> super stone guy is on the front of it and it's just uh um was everywhere and that became an in joke the bulgari ad became a you know i love the ads before the movies because they always get memeified basically before the uh festival is ended and and the we poster and the bulgari ad were those two ones that i felt like got the most uh, attention and then you mentioned the christie's uh you know projector ad which was this weird like valentine's day romance like heart thing of like people cuddling and it was just like the weird um, owl screening for that was the best where the one person was like you get him christy <laughs> yeah like so those are the fun kind of like things not about the, we'll get into the movies um for sure and you the can, movies. like i said uh you can check out our review of fablemans and all that kind of stuff but um it's uh it was a good time dude like i had i had a great time you know me and you just kind of stick together and we bumped into a lot of people like i mentioned i got to see some movies with my wife uh nevis my mom went to her first couple tiff movies so that was really really cool to finally share this thing that i've loved for so long with my mom who knows how much i don't shut up about it in late august early september um that was awesome the visa infinite lounge was pretty dope um got to, like i got a visa infinite card this year and a, not a sponsor or anything is a sponsor of tiff um not a sponsor of ump uh, yeah uh that was pretty dope because the first time we went into there before our brother screening we were like oh popcorn water and i saw like booze behind the bar and i thought it was just like a cash bar and then we're like is that included and they're like yeah i'm like oh my god this is incredible so like free booze before movies and stuff like that so didn't really go to many parties or anything like that that's not really our vibe during tiff i know that is some people's like that's all they do is go to parties um we try to focus on the movies especially when we're covering it for this show and stuff like that not saying that those people don't focus on the movies it's just i don't have the energy (laughs) to like but at the end of a three four movie day to also go to a party and be out till two in the morning or three in the morning or something like that. I just like, I, I can't do it. Um, if I got invited to some, maybe I would have, but it's the one thing we don't really get invited to, which is fine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, man, I had a, I had a great time. It was overall uh, a really kind of solid, consistent um, kind of stream of movies, at least in the 30 some that I saw, you could say that it was like, you know mid as the kids say because i gave a lot of threes and three and a halfs which is that kind of they're not middle of the road it's just like i mostly kind of at least thought something was okay at worst and like and there were a couple things i thought were really really great and only you know two or three movies that i thought were actually like bad or that i wish i didn't see so i think The batting average was really solid, even though, like I said, a lot of them in that three, three and a half range, but I'll take a three and three and a half. That means at least there's something in there that I thought was worthwhile. So how'd you feel overall? Yeah. I mean, there was some stuff there. There there were a couple highs that I think were like not only the best of the fest, but could possibly be the best of the year. And then there were stuff that was like, oh, this is really good, like solid work and Um, it's great watching these movies with an audience because we did a lot of public screenings more so than P and I's compared to previous years. Um, and then there were, yeah, there were maybe two or three films that I would say are truly not my cup of tea, you know, and, and, and didn't work for me in the slightest, you know, being the greatest beer run ever and roost, um but Which yeah we're like in the same boat for like it, it is interesting when we we're both like on the exact same page when it yeah. comes to like what is objectively bad <laughs> yeah and, and and there's plenty of stuff where there that we did kind of either split on a little bit 
more or less i'm thinking of something like decision to leave which i really loved and you respected more than you like liked it but yeah. that's fine you know we'll, we'll we'll have a review for that that movie opens at the end of october um it will be playing at the the tip bell light box and um, mongrel media is handling it here in canada and then Mubi uh internationally so um if park chan wook fans are excited to you know dig into his next movie it's not too much longer uh, until checking that one out um yeah it, it was just i think i think part of this year that excited me the most and, and i think it was the same for you and you were just talking about it was just kind of reintegrating back into the festival community and being you know amongst both peers and the public and having that enemies. experience and uh uh <laughs> denny Velnov's enemy um i mean there are some sketchy spiders in a couple movies that i saw but yeah i think overall it was more so just trying to enjoy uh those two weeks as much as possible with a little bit of stress here and there uh you know matt and i were not only covering the festival but we did do a couple of interviews matt did an interview for she hulk which you can go and check out now i did one uh, for the movie causeway and you know we do the best we can we don't consider ourselves maybe you know like top tier journalists and have everything down pat but you know we put the effort into it and when you have that anxiety or stress before an interview uh, that means, you know, you you do care about it, but it can be kind of consuming to the point where everything else around you is hard to kind of interact with or engage with in a manner that kind of feels, you know, genuine, you know, and, 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 and you want to give every movie and, you know, every conversation as much, you know, credit as you can and, and, and and be there in the moment and be as lucid as possible. So, you know, that's why we didn't do as many interviews either, but the ones we did, I think, you know, were, were good, you know, like, and, and, you know, you can listen to them now. Um, but yeah, I, I think when it comes down to it, it was really about self care, you know, this, this in these two weeks that knowing your limit, you know, I made the joke yesterday with Kyle, uh, know your limit, play within it um and having two or three movies a day and then also knowing that it's okay to stop at that point and feeling like you know you don't want to be completely exhausted the next day you know we the first official day of the festival we saw weird the al yankovich story uh at, with midnight madness and with that crowd and it's it's an amazing experience but also the backside of that is that you have to wake up you know three or four hours later um, yeah to see a movie possibly at uh, eight or nine in the morning and that's where i think you know those decisions were made to kind of cut off some of the early morning screenings and find uh, i slept in a lot option. more this year yeah. than uh than usual i um i used to you know want to cram my day being like i need to take advantage of this right like it's once a year kind of thing but i still think seeing 30 some movies like not a lot of people get to do that and um i gotta you know understand that sleep is important food is important you know stuff like that and like you said to keep your brain kind of lucid um to only kind of limit yourself to the what you feel like you can do and um, yeah, two to three feels like the sweet spot where you still have time to do other stuff. You still have time to sleep in. I think it's different this year where I was coming in from Etobicoke, so it was a little bit more of a pain in the ass. Like the Up Express is very convenient. It's it's 15 minutes to get downtown, but like it still runs only every half hour. I got to kind of time that right. I still have to go get to the train station and things like that. Like it wasn't just a quick zip down like when I lived on Queen Street or in walking distance and things like that. So those things all, all, all kind of played a factor in the behind the scenes of how we handled the festival this year. But like, you know, I'm happy. I think we put out 11 reviews during the festival, which is at least one per day, even though we kind of put them in big chunks. Um, and and it was for some of the biggest stuff, the biggest stuff of the festival, the stuff that will get the most buzz. And that's kind of how we need to prioritize our reviews when it comes to festivals like this. Um, and then, you know, some of that smaller stuff, some of the stuff we're passionate about that we want to talk about or not passionate about will kind of trickle out um, over the next little while. But I think uh, overall, it was incredibly fun, incredibly exhausting. Um you know, I just liked the vibes this year. Like it really felt like everyone, the energy 
you know, was back and like, even though on those last days, which I usually never see a movie on the last day of the festival. Cause I'm so broken. Like I'm a, I made this joke on your show. Like I'm a broken shell of a human, uh, by the end, but I went and saw Carmen on the last day of the festival and it was a packed screening, right? Like even these, you know, movies that aren't these big buzzy kind of movies, um, still had packed showings on the last day of the festival, which I think is very telling. And, you know, there were some big changes this year with, um, everything kind of being on festival street. So you removed, uh, the winter garden, uh, the Elgin, um, the former Ryerson theater. Um, and like, so you kind of, and obviously they slowly eliminated varsity and hot docs and Isabel Bader. So like everything from that, like when it used to span all of Toronto from bluer South, basically now it's just all on that, like literal three blocks of King street, it feels like. So it's, it's very contained and you do feel like you have this little festival village almost now, which I, I, I like that vibe of it. Like, um, some people might be missing those other theaters, but I thought the Royal Alexandra, at least for the screening we went to for weird, um, really brought the house down felt like a midnight madness crowd. Like I didn't think you lost any of that energy. They're able to sell beer now there, which is like perfect for midnight madness, I think, and stuff like that. Like you can sell alcohol at the rat. Um, and, uh, I just, uh, I, I really think they kind of knocked it out of the park this year. I know there's some snafus. We talked about our ticket thing when we did our preview preview show and, you know, scheduling. I've seen some people go, you know, especially on the press side of things, like it's hard to see everything that you either need to see or want to see. Um, and then on the public side of things, you know, there's a lot of screenings of certain movies and then only two or three screenings of others. So I don't know. It's hard to make everyone happy, but I think overall everyone I've talked to had a pretty, you know, solid experience this year. Yeah. And, and, and I think like that first weekend, you know, when King street is pretty much blocked off and, you know, you can basically walk around almost anywhere within that vicinity um is kind of was kind of surreal this year um it's also one of those things where you know as soon as that weekend ends and they lift the blockades and everything goes back to normal it takes a minute to adjust and you almost want to wander out into the street um in in terms of you know like how things are scheduled for the festival and what screenings air you know play when i can understand like especially a lot of people that are coming you know from other parts of canada or internationally and only are staying for maybe half of the festival or a few days and it's like okay you want to get in as much as possible and so you want to hit these movies as well for your outlet or uh, whatever your coverage may be and if they're not playing those days or they're playing against something else that you also either want to see or have been assigned to cover it makes things difficult but that's always been the case um, with TIFF because it is such a large festival to sustain overall compared um, to a lot of other festivals where, you know, you'll get maybe one or two um, press screenings a day. You know, Matt's talked about, you know, his experience with the New York Film Festival in the past and, you know, even covering Cannes, you know, there, it's it's more divided where, you know, there, there's a lot of options, but not everything is maybe the thing that you want, or again, you have to make choices. Um, but if you are staying for the fe full, full festival, then that you can also... usually fit everything in as long as you don't yeah. have, like if you're making your own work schedule, like we are where we can cover what we want, you can usually fit everything. I think it's a struggle for people who have to do interviews or have a day job that they have to, you know, or do red carpets and stuff like that. Like it does make it difficult for, um, those people and then on the public side of things it's just an a an access thing like with how expensive it is or you have to get a package or it sells out and they do ad screenings and i felt like it wasn't too bad to get you know if you wanted a specific ticket and you're a huge fan and know how to kind of navigate the system you i think most people were able to see you know, our friend Ryan Hancock goes to the festival and he saw like every big movie and yeah, sure. You might not go to the first or second screening of it, but if you are down to go at some point in the festival, usually you have an opportunity unless it's like a smaller film that only has, you know, one or two show times and they're all at Scotiabank or something like that in the smaller theater. So, um, yeah, overall, it seemed like everyone really kind of dug the vibe, dug the movies, like, everyone I talked to was like, yeah, more things than not have been pretty solid. Like, 
I think I enjoyed almost like 90% of the movies that I saw, at least in some sense, like found something I liked about them. And like those couple that you mentioned, Eric, with um, Greatest Beer Run Ever and Roost are really the only two off the top of my head where I'm like, oh, I wish I didn't watch them (laughs) or I wish I didn't have to sit through that entire thing. Um, Other than that, like for the most part, I at least found something interesting, even if I didn't vibe with the movie completely or or, or something like that. Um, Anything you want to touch on on the experience before we get into the actual movies or or do you want to just head? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was again like it was just pretty laid back. It had more of a kind of, you know, as the kids are saying, chill vibe um overall like it kind of it didn't feel like there was any real passive aggressive kind of you know things going on where like sometimes when you get to a certain day and you'll go sit in a seat and somebody will be like oh i was saving this for somebody or something like that like there wasn't really much of that going on at all and um it, it kind of felt again like it was more about kind of getting back into this festival routine and you know some people um like joey magazine who i cannot believe went from telluride to this and then you know is going to also be covering new york it's like you know you just go from one festival to another to another um in terms of like traveling wise and things like that and and you know it, it shows you how you know busy some people can get this time of year covering this stuff and then us where you know we're our own bosses so we can be a little bit more leisurely when it comes to what we see when we see it but yeah the enthusiasm just to see a movie um and not just the stars i think was something that was really kind of moving in a way because like not just moving in a picture frame but like just you know touching and moving in that way because you know that those last couple of days you know theaters were packed you know our you mentioned carmen you know the same day i saw carmen or the same day you saw carmen i saw how to blow up a pipeline and that theater was full and part of that was because of the buzz it was getting or building even before neon picked it up you know uh, peter kaplowski was uh, a champion of it from uh, the programmer of uh, midnight madness and he was there to do the intro at um that last screening and um you know it's also nice when a movie like that is not only a discovery for the festival in a lot of ways but it lives up to the hype that has come before it because there's a lot of stuff where it's like if you're the first one in to see something there might be some uh, hyperbole when it comes to you know oh this is you know the best movie of the year or this is you know a, a, i can't believe i had this experience overall and it's like those things are true and you don't want to take that away from somebody but at the same time it's like okay you know li- doing the festival thing you're in kind of a bubble as well and that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to have that same impact on everybody else and it's 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 the vice versa you know there's some movies we saw where we we liked but didn't love like something like clement virgo's uh, brother but we've talked to other people that really really loved it and that opens up a new perspective and it's like oh i didn't think about it that way and and it's like i'm glad that the, i got i got to have that conversation with somebody you know mm-hmm. um and so Absolutely. like so things like that i think I, I i i really appreciated um overall yeah i think that's what's interesting about film festivals in general because i feel like you can get caught up in the vibes and in the atmosphere and in the audience and 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 things like that both in a good way and a bad way and i'm guilty of that sometimes too where you know whether what mindset you're in how tired you are um you know how great the audience reaction is like i feel like all of that can kind of play a part into that hyperbole during festivals where either uh, everything is amazing or um everything might... is awesome <laughs> yeah like a lot of the times it's just like this movie was amazing this movie was amazing because you kind of feed off that energy of the crowd and and seeing it with three thousand people and and you know seeing it before everyone else so you get to be the first person to tweet about something or or tell your friends about it like i think that does play a part into festival reactions that can also go the other way where i feel like I'm very guilty of this sometimes too, where I can be very medium on a movie or even negative on a movie where I go back and rewatch it years later when it's the only movie I watched that day. I'm completely removed from the festival experience and the hyperbole and the buildup and the anticipation. And I go, oh shit, that was really good. Or the other way around, I rewatch something that I loved at the festival where I go, huh, that wasn't 
that was fine or that was not so great, but I got caught up into like, you know, that festival experience with it or just sometimes not knowing anything about a movie and just seeing it for the first time without seeing a trailer or just only having a description and things like that. So yeah, all of those play a part. And I think maybe that's part of it this year and we'll get into the films themselves, but um, yeah, it is always interesting just to see the reactions from certain movies like, um, and just as the festival as a whole, but let's get into the movies themselves. Um, We might as well just jump right into it and see what we, what we felt um, about everything. Um, Like I mentioned, I think it was a pretty solid year all around. Like my list is almost kind of like in tears where I think my top five, I think are interchangeable. Like Like you could really have like this movie be, you know, uh, your number one, but then have this other movie be your number one. Yeah. I think like my top five could shift around in like maybe any order, depending on, you know, I'll sit on these movies for a little longer for the rest of the year and I'll kind of um, maybe rewatch a couple of them and, and, and think about it. And um, I don't even know, does pipeline have a release date yet or no, no I think yeah. neon will release it probably next year. Next year. That's a quick yeah. thing. I also want to mention as well. There wasn't as many films that, coming into the festival that didn't already have distribution there wasn't yeah. a lot of talk about movies being picked King, up by there's a couple which we'll mention but yeah. Pipe, pipeline did get picked up by neon as eric mentioned so yeah that'll probably come out next year so it might not even be on my best of the year this year but i mean you still t- um, can technically put it on uh, do i don't do i go by i go by like release theatrical date. release yeah, yeah no, I, I go by too. release date but, but people um, do sometimes do that yeah, so I have these tiers where like one to five are the excellent movies that I feel like I could shift around. And then like my six through God, six through twenty, I think are like all very interesting movies in different ways that might not have been perfect and might have like some even be closer to bad than good, but like I still really, really enjoyed my time with movies six through twenty. And then I would say 21 through 20, 21 through 30 um, are the ones that I'm like, okay, some of them are okay. Some of them are not so okay. Um, I liked elements of there, um, but I just, they just, I'm indifferent mostly on a lot of those movies. And then 31, 32, 33 are the ones that I was like, oof, I do not do not like these movies and that's a good batting average personally and i'll get into what those movies are i can run through my whole list and eric you can do yours and we can kind of just talk about the movies and the people's choice and all of that as a whole so um i'll go in reverse order for me and then you guys now have that context of how i kind of group these um so i'm gonna go from 33 up to number one i'm just gonna go through everything might as well um this is our super episode might as well go through a full tiff wrap up um, this could change, like Eric mentioned too, like it, it changes every day when I look at this list and like, when I go, Oh, I did like that movie better than that movie. Oh, I I'm sitting on that movie a little longer. I like it. The more I like, there's a movie that's in my top, you know, 10 right now. When, when I first saw it, I was like, eh, I don't know. And then the more I thought about it, the more I talked with Eric, the more I talked about the movie, I was like, no, this movie's really good. And I, um, so anyways, let's get into it. Uh, 33 is the greatest beer run ever. <laughs> Uh, 32 is Roost. We'll get into all these movies once Eric gives you his list too, and we'll pick and choose which ones we want to talk about. Uh, number 31 is Devotion. Uh, number 30, um, maybe, you know, this is one of the people's choice winners, but it just, I'll get into my reasoning behind it. But 30 is Black Ice. Uh, 29 is The Swimmers. 28 is Biosphere. 27 is Woman King. 26 is The Banshees of Ed Sheeran um uh 25 is the inspection 24 is brother 23 is decision to leave 22 is holy spider 21 is causeway um so that would be like the lower levels of my list um now we're getting into like 20 and higher are all things that um i i thought were interesting at least or um or divisive in in different ways and i had more to say or feel about them so at number 20 i have carmen at number 19 i have empire of light at number 18 uh return to soul number 17 the good nurse number 16 the blackening number 15 pearl uh which is now playing in 
theaters. So that's one that you guys can go see right now. Uh, number 14 is Weird, the Al Yankovic story. Uh, number 13 is The Whale. Number 12 is The Menu. Number 11 is One Fine Morning. Number 10 is Bros. Number 9 is Moon Age Daydream, which is also now playing in theaters that you guys can go check out. Number 8 is I Like Movies. Number 7 is After Sun. Number 6 is Triangle of Sadness. Number f- And here's my top 5 of the ones that I really loved. Uh, number 5 is All the Beauty and the Bloodshed. Number four is The Fablemans. Number three is Woman Talking. Number two is How to Blow Up a Pipeline. And number one is Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery. Uh, So that was my whole festival. It was 33 films. Um, Like I said, enjoyed the majority of them. So even when I said like that 21 through 30 are movies that I all pretty much gave three stars or above to. So it's not like I think any of those are like, objectively bad movies um so a pretty good you know batting average overall but i'll get more into specific movies and, and stuff like that i guess after eric uh, gives his list eric, yeah have I'm you act- done your list or i'm you still doing- i'm doing i'm <laughs> fixing it right now because i'm just like oh i don't know if i want i can talk about mine that. some more if you want uh, yeah yeah before. please yeah, do yeah. please do yeah so like i mentioned um glass onion uh if people listen to our knives out review from a couple of years ago, uh, I've talked about that movie a, a few times. Um, it could be part of that, you know, tiff brain or that festival brain that I was just mentioning before I gave this list where knives out. I, it just didn't really click with me. I didn't think it was a bad movie. Um, I enjoyed it for what it was. Uh, I thought the mystery kind of played its cards too early and then it kind of lost me from there. Um, and never won me back, but I didn't not enjoy knives out, but I was kind of like medium on it. So to my surprise, uh, I couldn't believe how much fun I had with glass onion, a movie that you guys can check out a review for it if you want more in depth, but like that starts a bit rough to the point where I'm like, oof, maybe I was right about knives out. Um, and then picks up once they get to Greece and then it's just an absolute blast from then, like with a great mystery, great performances, uh, an absurd kind of uh, plot and, and moments. Daniel Craig just chewing it up and, and Janelle Monet and and Ed Norton just absolutely killing it. So uh, I, I loved Glass Onion and I'm surprised at how much I loved it. Just a really fun movie that I think I saw at the perfect time. And then How to Blow Up a Pipeline, I think, was my surprise of the fest where just like I saw it pretty late, just like Eric did, too. And and it I got up at eight in the morning for it. And um, it just absolutely blew me away. One of the most well-crafted kind of thrillers I've seen in a long, long time with an incredible score. I love the cinematography and the performances and how all these characters come together for this event, um, I thought was fantastic. Uh, a woman talking, um, just an absolute brutal watch but in a good way Uh, i love the editing and the structure of that movie with amazing performances and uh sarah Pauly just not even dropping a step after not making a feature for for a decade so um i think an important movie uh for the time and and just uh, a movie everyone should go see i think it's excellent fablemans the people's choice winner we got to see spielberg in person which was a crazy experience um just a, an icon and an idol. And I, I, I say this on every time I talk about it, but Eric's favorite movie is Jaws. My, fa- my favorite movie is uh, Jurassic Park. So it's like, obviously that was a super special and important night to be there. And then luckily the movie lives up to that where it is quite good. Um, you can check out a review of that as well. Um, overacted in moments and a little showy in moments, but like still a really solid family drama. Um, uh, Gabriel LaBelle is, is fantastic. The lead actor. Um, and then all the beauty and the bloodshed, which I think is again, one of the most well-crafted documentaries I've seen in a long time. That's both a character piece, but also, you know, a, a piece on the opioid crisis and how it kind of uses those, you know, um, nan golden's uh you know story and her history in the art world and uh but then also her addiction problems and and her kind of trying to stop what what's the people's names the family so name? she's trying to hold the sackler yeah. family sackler accountable family, for yeah. their part in the opioid crisis yeah. and how it has that personal connection, connection to, to her her yeah. but also to people around her and yeah and, and it perfectly encapsulates both her activism and artistry um in a way that 
uh, Laura uh, Poitras uh, really does, um, you know, emphasize throughout this film. And like, it's not just simply like a classic, like talking heads documentary. It's very proactive. It's very in the moment. And then when we do see, you know, her art, there's an aspect of that where like, you know, a lot of it is like experimental kind of with slideshows and sort of looking at time, uh, you know, the delineage of time and, and, and seeing that reflected in her work um, is incredible. And yeah, and she's just a great subject to, to have a conversation with and, and she brings really powerful insights and understanding to what, people are going through having lost family to overdoses uh, yeah. through the opioid crisis. And yeah, there are moments in there that are completely um, unflinching and powerful, but also um, just a, a great wealth of history, especially, you know, on the New York side of things from the 1960s into uh, the eighties, there's a movie called variety directed by Betty Gordon. Uh, that there's a couple clips uh, taken from that Kino Lorber just released not too long ago on Blu-ray um, that's in this movie and she's in the film and I didn't realize she was in the film but I was watching the scene I was like I own this movie on Blu-ray and I just watched it for the first time a few years ago and it's like oh okay so she's part of that movement and right. other people that you'll recognize as well within that are John Waters and uh, Jim Jarmusch uh, and, and Cookie Mueller and, and people like that so I, I was I, I didn't really know much about uh, nan golden going into Same, this yeah. so maybe that also does help a little bit in terms of just you know appreciating it more from the point of view of a novice but um it's such a well-constructed documentary and an example of why you don't necessarily need to do a fictionalized biopic you can you can tell a great story about someone's in a life doc, yeah in a doc um, that so, is yeah. engaging and exciting and sad and all that yeah it, those top five i think are some of the best movies of the year in my opinion and um you know even some of the other things that i'm sure will be in eric's top five that aren't in mine that i some i agree with some i i don't but um yeah and then just picking and choosing a couple other things eric before uh, you yeah. jump into your list like um i would say chandler lavax i like movies uh, a very a movie that hits really close to home to eric and i being you know growing up during the mid 2000s in a gta suburb going to a blockbuster constantly or a video store constantly uh, and falling in love with movies while being you know a, a young man and, and maybe a little opinionated and a bit of a, a jerk at times and and how we learned through that era and seeing that in this character uh, and in this movie was was wonderful. So shout out to I like movies, which I think is is great. Um, yeah, and then um, other surprises that are you know this is why my list could um, kind of move around. I really thought the Blackening was enjoyable, which is a, a movie that didn't hasn't been picked up yet, but I think there's a little bit of a bidding war on for that. Um, you know, I in the Whale, which is I know some of people's. Um, one of people's most anticipated movies of the festival. I thought um, Brendan Fraser was great or Fraser. Uh, it was great, but um, the movie surrounding it was just kind of good, but not great. That's why it kind of falls into the middle of the pack for me. Um, uh, Bros, which comes out quite soon, probably in like a week and a half. Um, yeah. September 23rd. It is it's an incredibly important groundbreaking kind of uh, studio comedy that I thought um is i think is is great because of those things the comedy didn't always land for me but it's still like a thoroughly enjoyable studio comedy uh, i always love mia hansen loves movies and they're just kind of chill and and feel like real life and, and realistic to life um so there's a lot of good stuff there i mean um I, I'll, I left out a couple that I know you're going to talk about, Eric. But um, yes, yeah, certain things I liked more sitting on them, like the menu, which I was kind of medium on when I watched it. Now I'm medium positive afterwards where like I, I like the style and, and, and stuff like that. But I do think we'll get into that in our review of that movie that I think it I have so many food puns for that, Eric. But like <laughs> it wants to have its cake and eat it two a little bit but like that's why it kind of falls but it's still in you know top 12 right so and then some of my hot takes which maybe i'll save the hot takes for after because we'll we'll keep this segment as the the positive part but still go through your whole list 
Yeah, so I'll I'll do this quickly. I mean, I'm still not completely satisfied with it, but I mean that's oh neither you know, am lists, I. I'm gonna lists move are this so arbitrary yeah. in general, where it's just like you know they like if you'd rather they're... just give your top five or ten. No, no, I'll, I'll I think the I think you kind of said it perfectly, where it's kind of like they're almost in tiers, where it's like okay, yeah. this grouping of film are like the lower end and could be anywhere from like one to two or two and a half, and then this group is like you know three. And then this is like three and a half and then the higher you get. And, yeah. I, and I think like, that's kind of like where I am, where it's like, it doesn't necessarily mean like the order number wise is, you know, spot yeah, on. They're in groups, so just a yeah. group, a, a cluster of these, of these films. So, uh, 39, uh, the greatest beer run ever, uh, 38 roost 37, the sun 36, uh, the lost King 35 empire of light 34 devotion, 33 corsage 32 the good nurse 31 the whale 30 biosphere 29 weird a uh, al yankovich story uh, 28 the swimmers 27 uh, the maiden 26 brother 25 the blackening 24 sanctuary 23 the inspection 22 holy spider 21 emily uh 20 causeway 19 broker uh 18 brothers 17 pearl 16 nanny uh 15 the wonder 14 the eternal daughter 13 triangle of sadness 12 i like movies 11 one fine morning 10 return to soul 9 the fablemans 8 the banshees of inishirin uh 7 how to blow up a pipeline 6 Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery, number five, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, number four, Women Talking, number three, RMN, number two, Decision to Leave, and number one, After Sun. A very Eric list and a very Matt list. <laughs> Like, um, it, it, it's just funny seeing the slight differences in in personal preference i think uh but please talk about kind of some of your favorites yeah so uh, after sun was something that we screened before the festival it played at can and i believe the director's fortnight um stars paul mescal and it's a story from the point of view um, of the writer director it's an auto fiction story or an account of a father daughter going on a trip uh, to turkey and spending uh, the remaining days of the summer uh, at a resort before the new school year begins and as the uh, sort of relationship begins to tether we see um, both of these characters' lives kind of going separate ways and how this reflection of this one moment in time is relived on occasion from the point of view of the older version of uh, the main character and how we see her looking at it from the point of view of an adult versus when she was a child and in the moment and sort of seeing her own dad struggling uh, with uh, depression and mental illness. Uh, Paul Mescal uh stars in the lead role as the dad and it's a very kind of quiet um contemplative work that i feel is very moving in a way that's non-manipulative and it's almost like holding on to a moment the way that you do by looking at a photo you know every now and then and reliving that experience and then also kind of filling in the blanks or or, or trying to find your own continuity of that and, and and add to it and we see that with you know the 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 paul mescal character kind of walking around and kind of doing his own thing and trying to make sense of what was going on in that moment um in these two characters lives and i was just really moved by it and again like it just felt very much like it was of that period in the late 90s not only with you know the the music cues whether they be you know uh drinking in la or or something by aqua it it felt it and looked like something that came from the 90s and didn't feel like it was made now and i mean that as a good thing it, it feels almost like an artifact in its cinematography and in its structuring and 
the performances are so natural and fun. There's a great moment where, you know, there's this water park that uh, the, the mom and, or the, the dad and the, and the daughter go to. And um, we see this frustrated dra- dad dragging his kids and shouting at them. Like, why can't we have a good time? And like that little moment kind of, again, rings so true in the details of it all. So yeah, it was the film that kind of, has stayed with me the longest and kind of the more I think about it, the more I, I love it. And I, I'm actually really excited to see it again and, and kind of, you know, look further into what the movie is saying and, and, you know, get those little cues because we see a lot of, you know, self-help books and things like that. So we are, are given, you know, um, clues into how the character is feeling in the moment. But I think that it would be more, rewarding on a, on a second viewing so that was the film that was just kind of like oh wow like everything else that i was seeing was kind of like i was comparing it to after sun not in the way that's like oh well it, it doesn't have these elements that after sun has but just in terms of like oh did, does this movie make me feel the same way that i did watching the film you know and, and i think anybody who you know gr- grew up with uh divorced parents and things like that will also kind of have some connection to it as well especially when you're with one of your parents and you know you're on vacation or you know you're just spending quality time and trying to connect with somebody that maybe you've had some distance towards over a period and and i feel the fablemans has a little bit of that in there as well especially (laughs) with how uh sammy you know sees something specifically you know, through the act of filmmaking that will not only make him grow up a little sooner, but also something that puts him in a situation that is very mature and and, and tough to handle, I think, for anybody. And like those moments are the ones that you kind of, again, you know, if, if you've gone through that, you'll, you'll understand it really quite well. And even something like like I like movies has something similar to that where the absence of a parent is felt and you know you kind of your your perspective changes on things and you you change as a person and um you know that affects your own uh relationships with other people and I think that that's something that you know all three of those movies have in common in some way or another that I kind of gravitated towards, but then, you know, like glass onion, you know, I, I agree with what you were saying where it's, it's this pure entertainment that works, you know, fundamentally as a popcorn flick, but also has a really great anti-capitalist stand. That's very cheeky and playful and isn't necessarily, you know, um, hitting you over the head, but it's there. And, you know, like it's, it's, it's a film that's kind of like, you know, layers, eat, man. <laughs> well, it's like eating your broccoli, but putting like melted cheese on it. You know, like it's like you're getting the best of both worlds in that way. And and Ryan Johnson um, knows how to construct a really thrilling set piece in kind of the most unexpected ways. Uh, there, there's a moment in the film where it's like it's on par with any Mission Impossible action set piece. That kind of is like again, like it's 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 little and it's it's but the payoff of it is amazing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you, you, you watch something like that during the festival. It also helps kind of break up some of the more dense um, and darker movies that again, you know, very appreciative of those films, but it is nice to have something that is a little bit lighter, but also has something to say. And I think after having also watched glass onion, I cooled a little bit more on triangle of sadness where I still like triangle of sadness quite a bit, but at the same time, it's not as good as the last couple of Ruben Austin movies. And I was expecting more um, from it overall. And, and, and that's nothing against the film. That's more on me when it comes to the expectations of something, but it does feel like glass onion kind of, made a more interesting and also very entertaining and engaging sort of perspective or pointed opinion on capitalism where and the social elite and kind of all that yeah it's yeah a, it's a great point because i think that's been a trend and at tiff there's three movies glass onion triangle of sadness and the menu that are all kind of trying to do the same thing and i agree that glass onion does it in the most entertaining way and also does it in in the most interesting way and then i agree with triangle even though i have it in my top six that i think just shows how much i like ruben ostland 
as a filmmaker more than some of these other movies because I will still take a Ruben Austin movie that I think is maybe his weakest out of of the, those three that you mentioned. Um, but I still found enough in there to be like, well, this is still such a unique and singular vision that I'd still take that over some of this other stuff that is like, you know, good. But like, I feel like it's still that's why I think Triangle is still so high on my list. But yeah, and, and there's there's some other stuff as well. Like, uh, I think the um, the Romanian movie RMN is a really powerful and understated um vision from a director who has everything i've seen of this guy christian uh Mungun, mungani i believe or munguni um is he's working at a level that i think most filmmakers would aspire to and i even tweeted that where like i just i feel like every aspect of his direction and his choices that he's making he's in complete control but it feels at times like you're watching not a documentary, but a very realistic, natural kind of um, episode of a character's life or a moment in, you know, a community unravel, you know, four months, three weeks and two days is um, a, a powerful uh, abortion um, film that takes place in the 80s and looks at Romanian law at that point and how mm-hmm. difficult and dangerous it was to get an abortion at that point. And then you have films like Graduation uh, and Beyond the Hills that look at um, religious and um, educational institutions and how they can be corrupted or manipulated based on who um, is in charge of those things. And those movies, to me, all all of them in RMN, feel like he completely understands not only the story that he's telling, but also the deafness in which he has to enlighten international audiences because RMN is a story about this small Romanian village that's kind of split between Romanians and Hungarians and then you have, you know, a lot of migrant workers, but then you also have um, a lot of Romanians le- leaving this village because there's not a lot of work with the exception of this uh, bread factory. So a lot of them are going over to Germany to work and experiencing, um, you know, hard times and hardships there and uh, adversity. And so one of the characters who's kind of like this macho kind of guy comes back to his village after um, assaulting one of the German workers and you know we see the way that he is treated within this german factory and called some horrible slurs and then when you have um you know these sri lankan workers coming in to romania to work at this bread factory for minimum wage how the rest of the community treats them to the point where it's not only offensive it's hypocritical you know this catholic church going community is basically saying, you know, like, we're not racist, but um, we would be fine with them going back to, you know, their own country to live and like talking in a way that is just like, admit what you're saying is horrible. And they're not. And it's so frustrating to watch. And there's moments where, you know, like the characters are having this conversation at a uh, town hall meeting at a cultural center. And it's one shot and it feels like it's about 10 to 15 minutes long and we get sort of the mayor addressing the community. And then afterwards you have, you know, people giving their two cents and it's never not interesting or powerfully told. And it's again, like, it's not a showy shot, but it does, you start to notice like, Oh, this, this shot has not moved in the last like three or four minutes. And then it continues to go and it feels like a real, moment and like it kind of shows you like again like you could compare it to like you know trump uh enthusiasts and voters kind of you know coming out of the the woodwork and sort of you know treating those that they consider the other or somebody else um horribly and getting away with it and so i think that movie does it well and it doesn't hit you over the head it's very um urgent in its conversation and there are multiple languages that are spoken that are highlighted so german hungarian and um romanian and and that might confuse people as well a little bit in terms of 
who's speaking what language or when characters say like, oh, this character can speak this language, but they have an accent when they do it. Um, but I, I found it really, really compelling and just a really powerful um, story about community and hypocrisy within it. As, Sorry, as, my no, 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 no. I, keep, I was rambling, trying, so. No, no, no. If you can hear the dinging on my computer, I don't know why it's not coming through my headphones. Uh, sorry, you're talking about a very, like, um, important kind of uh, uh, movie, and, and it was very well put, Eric. I'm sorry if you kept hearing my. No, 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 that's okay. That's okay. I wasn't, I wasn't sure if it was something like, like you know, you needed to take a minute to. No, um, no, no, to... no, 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 no. It's, it's totally okay. Um, I. Uh, I'm going to just do this, and then we should be good. I put my podcasting focus mode on. Um, so but yeah, I, I, I found he it should be, be coming a, through my uh, my headphones. Yeah. But I'm glad you really liked it. Um, yeah, it's an IFC movie, so it will get distribution at some point, oh and it'll God. probably want be one of those films that plays in like art house theaters and uh, the light box. I'm sure will have a, a screening, you know, or screenings of it when it, it, it does get a theatrical release. It doesn't have distrib- like a release date as of yet, but IFC will probably release it either, you know, at the end of this year, or the beginning of next year. Yeah. And, and I don't like dwelling too much on, on the bad stuff per se. I like, I, I think there's a funny line in the greatest beer run ever, which um, is one of the most ridiculous pieces of writing. And, and like, you can even tell that, as it was being put in and it's like, Oh, that's a really clever, is like, it a little less drinking, a little more thinking. It sure is. <laughs> and it's just like, Oh wow. You've summed <laughs> up the whole movie in this most like, Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's so awful. It, it's really bad. I, again, I don't like harping on stuff that, uh, uh, we hate either. I'm trying to grow from that kind of stuff, but like it, it was just, it was the only movie that was, um, tough to kind of get through. Um, Anything else you wanted to talk about, like uh, surprises or just like maybe sleeper movies or or things you just want to shout out that might not be in your top five or whatever, but you want to give them a little shout out or. Yeah, I mean, I really liked The Wonder more than I thought I would. And I don't know why I'm saying that, because I've liked mostly everything I've seen of Sebastian Lilio um, and Florence Pugh is one of the best actors working today and you know, like the story itself, I was kind of like, okay, is this going to be like almost like an investigative procedural? And it, and it is, and it even has some elements of like ace in the hole where you have this English nurse going to Ireland to watch a young girl who claims to have not eaten in four months and is become this, you know, miracle as, as some of the kind of more uh, God fearing Catholic uh, locals have, have, said so they're trying to either prove or disprove it um ari wagner's cinematography is gorgeous uh pew's performance is steadfast throughout this entire thing um there are moments that are really profound and frustrating in that way that religion can kind of intervene with you know health and wellness in a way that um i think is uh both captivating and provocative to have that conversation um again not a perfect movie but i think it has a lot more going on than i was expecting it to and it's a lot less it's less conventional as as well in terms of its framing device which i was kind of like oh wow i i did not expect it to do that in the opening scene and it's kind of like again it, it hooks you in that way and it's it's a great piece of intrigue um i didn't love the eternal we're not the... we're not oh wait the, you're still in a positive sense because i was like save the things you didn't love no 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 no, no. i didn't what i'm saying is i didn't love the eternal daughter the way you that did. i souvenir the souvenir part one and two but what joanna hogg has created um not only with the i, I believe it's shot on 16 millimeter it has a very kind of filmic kind of look to it is such a fascinating epilogue to the souvenir movie she shot this right after or or during part two as well and it's kind of a a minor movie from her but it's still a fascinating contemplation of her own life and where she is now and how it connects to the souvenir but also how it's its own thing and how it's also incorporating genre into uh, the story of being this kind of like gothic 
I don't even say ghost story, but it has sort of a gothic element to it um, where this kind of hotel takes on a life of its own in a way. And I think when you get to its kind of big climax, it is emotionally satisfying and very profound um, in, in what it's saying. It's just, it's a little bit, the more I think about it, the more I do like it. It's just one of those movies where it's like acclimatizing to this and thinking that this could possibly connect to the souvenir which even though is very stylish and audacious in what it's doing in terms of breaking you know conventional filmmaking techniques it still feels like that takes place in the real world where this is almost like a nicholas rogue kind of movie um very experimental so i still highly recommend checking it out but i was kind of like oh like this is this is good, but it's not the souvenir good, but it's still a fascinating um, depiction of a mother daughter relationship um, that I think is, is, is well worth your time, especially if you are a Tilda Swinton fan, if you are a uh, fan of Joanna Hogg's uh, previous movies as well. Uh, a film that we both saw that I've thought about more, um, even though I think our screening was kind of interrupted or bookended by uh, talking is return to soul. I keep yeah. thinking of certain moments within this story that takes place over or, or nearly a, a decade that's kind of broken and kind of like flash forwards. But we see this kind of one main character, Freddie, who is a French Korean uh, musician who goes back to Korea to Seoul to find her birth parents. And I found the central performance to be very um nuanced and genuine in a way that first time performers usually are um if you know working with the right filmmaker that can tailor a movie you know around that work and there's just something really interesting about how even just a couple years you know in terms of a time jump can be significant enough in terms of where you are who you're with what feelings you have towards somebody else or a situation. And I think those things I've like after sun, I've been ruminating a lot more on. Um, and I really appreciate that mongrel media has it in Canada. Sony pictures classics has it in uh, the U S a 24 has eternal daughter. I don't think that has Canadian distribution as of yet. Um, and then, yeah, is it, it part it, of that sphere of, film steal or no it might be but i didn't see it on the list yeah maybe because it doesn't um, have a release date yet or something yeah or and then it? no it doesn't and then how to blow up a pipeline like it's yeah what it is movie. the film it is the film of this festival i feel like it's one of those movies that like I yeah, everyone watch... knew glass onion fableman's women talking triangle of sadness you know those movies were kind of already on people's radar to be really great but i feel like that's yeah. the movie you know, and some of your, I think you have very Eric picks in your in your top movies that I think a specific group of people will really uh, vibe with. But I think um, Pipeline, I remember when I you didn't wake up for that press screening, and I no. was like, dude, you got to get a ticket for that last day. You have to, um, because it is. I I agree with you that it. I almost wanted to put it at number one just to make it a statement kind of thing, but. I can't argue with just like how much I enjoyed glass onion. <laughs> um, and yeah. I, I think, but I think very different movies, but pipeline like is right there. And I think it's a movie that I, it is that movie. I will shout from the rooftops to people, right? Like whenever it comes, whenever neon releases it, who has it in Canada? Does anyone have it? Or? I don't know. Sometimes elevation does get some of neon's film. So maybe it'll be through them. Yeah. It will get picked up in terms of like Canadian distribution. Yeah. It will find a home. So th there's, nothing to worry about but, there but but we yeah, haven't I, reviewed I, it yet but it's just one of the the most excellently like crafted thrillers i keep saying like I, it, again i think it's shot on 16 mil as well um the, it has that the, grainy filmic yeah. quality to it that kind of feels score. archival um it's about this like group of uh, uh, of people that come together to blow up this pipeline but they all come from different backgrounds and all have different reasons of why they want to kind of do this and the movie is so well edited and, and put together um, and structured to kind of um, show you their backstories while being this intense kind of thriller that reminded me of the you know some of the Bob bomb segments in Catherine Bigelow's um, 
uh, why am I blanking? The Hurt Locker. Uh, Hurt Locker um, and stuff like that, where it's just like at any moment, like the, you, there's these bomb making scenes and, and stuff like that, that are just some of the most. With Forrest in- Goodluck, yeah. who's best known as, as uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's son in uh, The Revenant. Um, and I just, I, I thought it was fantastic, dude. Yeah, it, it's it's editing and timing of how it's able to engage you both in the present moment, but also the flashbacks to the characters and how they all kind of intersected at one point or another is just as compelling and never throws off, um, you know, the 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 motions that are that are happening to achieve this it's part heist movie as well um it has elements of william freakin's sorcerer and wages of fear with the idea of any you know little thing that could change the chemical compound or or jostle it could you know make this whole thing go up in flames quite literally um you know it 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 feels akin in a way to even something like Kelly Reichardt's Night Moves, which was also kind of an ecological thriller, even though that movie is much more quieter and 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 not as kind of uh, kinetic in terms of its pacing. It feels like uh, Daniel uh, Goldhaber has kind of made this movie that's both, again, you know, talking about like eating your vegetables, but you know, having the 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 melted cheese on it he's he's found a way is that the make... theme of tiff this year <laughs> this this is this is the theme of tiff but but he's found a way to make both an entertaining movie yeah. and a film that has something to say yeah and and it doesn't feel like a soapbox kind of thing either where it's like somebody's like getting up and like saying like these things are bad corporations and big oil are bad it's like well yeah of course they are you know talking about anti-capitalism again it kind of it plays a little bit into here as well but it's like it's actually saying something from the point of view of people that have been affected by it. And it gives them motivation and understanding and empathy to these people for what they're doing and how they're doing it. And even they are having conversations about how this could affect, you know, working class people that need gas in order to get to work and stuff like that. So it's not just them trying to be self-righteous or, you know, take up a cause because they're bored. It's, you know, these people have been directly or indirectly affected by, you know, these corporations in some way or another. And, again like it's it's angry but it's angry in a focused and directed way that feels like it is just a laser beam channeled and there's not a moment wasted in this movie and i think like that alone is something to applaud and i I really liked uh gold haver's last movie as well cam and i want to go maybe want to yeah same like or i i haven't seen it so you talking about cam afterwards and just how much i loved this movie i'm like Okay, it's a Netflix movie too, right? Or, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I definitely will go back and, and watch it, especially during a spooky season. I know it's not like a classic Halloween type. No, but it, it is. It is a genre film, and it's playing with you know the idea of like psychology within a character and in, in, in a moment. But yeah, it's How to Blow Up a Pipeline is one of those movies where it's like I am so excited to see what he's going to do next. And he was there at the. Um, at the screening for the last day. Oh, really? And and he was even saying, like, as he was introing it, like, this is a collective work, you know, like, yeah, I directed it, but there are so many other people involved in getting this movie made. And like mm-hmm. even the the end credits, the way that they kind of are, are laid out, you 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 feel that, you know, um camaraderie and and it feels again, it's it's a ragtag group of people, but the performances and the filmmaking feel as one it's 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 succinct in that way so good man i will be thinking about it for a long time can't wait to see it again um for sure and especially when you haven't seen two other movies or or or, or it's your first movie at eight, at eight something in, the, in morning. the morning you yeah. know it was worth it dude getting up that early to go see that movie um okay uh that was the best movies of tiff we will be reviewing uh a lot of these movies, if not like all of the ones mentioned at some point, whether it's uh, in the immediate future, some already up or when Eric and I catch up with movies that the other person didn't see or we didn't see, but the other person saw. So right now you can check out reviews, though, for Glass Onion, The Fablemans, uh, Triangle of Sadness, 
uh, Bros, uh, The Whale, Weird. Um, what else do we have? Uh, Empire of Light, um, um, Bro Brothers. Sorry, I already mentioned Bros, uh, The Swimmers, um, and I think that's the majority of the ones we have up right now. So go. Yeah, check- and and I also want to say as well, um, you know, the first day of the festival, we were still. Re- you know, getting housekeeping done from films that we needed to see or discuss yeah. beforehand. So, you know, you have an interview with the director of Barbarian. I did an interview with the director of Causeway during the festival. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, you did an interview with one of the directors of She-Hulk. So there was still a lot, <laughs> like, even though we were Maybe watching Maybe we shouldn't movies, have been doing all that stuff around Tiff, but Right, hey, but Barbarian um, almost feels like an oh, unofficial... It was a- midnight madness movie and i think Peter i almost want to put it on agree. i almost want to put it on my tiff list yeah. um because i do I, agree with that i quickly got to tell my, uh, my we're not my story though. we're not wrapping yet i still want to no, go no, no, over no. disappointments or um movies or that you worst. you had do you want to go through let's get do you want to do your story at the end do you want to do it now do you want to um, let's do it at the end because we're still yeah. we're still on the talking about i wasn't movies, sure if we were yeah. wrapping up no so. i i want to talk about like biggest disappointments or like this is the bad section um but I, I don't necessarily want to call any of this bad per se, maybe other than greatest beer run. Um, but like, cause we did call this episode, the good, the bad and the Bulgari, the Bulgari will be that last section where you can tell your story and we'll talk about other, other random inside tip stuff, but in the bad sections or the worst movies of the festival, um, we've already gone through our list, but I don't know if there's anything you want to pick and choose and talk about specifically, maybe a biggest disappointment, your hottest take of the festival. Cause like I have a couple hot takes that I think are maybe not in line of what other people thought about certain movies. I think we're in agreement that roost and the greatest beer run ever are probably the, you know, those are our bottom two, even though you saw a little bit more than me and our lists are kind of jumbled where we agree with a lot of stuff, but some things are um, swapped. If you're comparing our two lists for this, like movies that you really loved that I didn't care about were like decision to leave. And, um, and I think that was the biggest. Well, kind the of Banshees of Inishirin. And Inishirin. I was going to get into that of my You hot appreciate takes, it yeah. a little bit more, more. after contemplating uh, it. I think I would rank it higher than what I even have now, just based on seeing some of the other films in front of it, because I think it's doing something more interesting than a lot of those movies. Yeah. Uh, so I think that is mo- one movie that could pop up but yes decision to leave and banshees are the two movies that i think we disagreed on the most decision to leave for me um a little all over the place a little uh, overly convoluted it lost me at times um the style is there and it has some great moments but to me just didn't come together um where it kind of I would go, what's happening or what is this? And like, it just kept, I kept playing catch up to it. And maybe that's just my brain at that point when we saw that movie, even though it was on day one, was it the first movie we saw? I think it was the first <laughs> movie we saw, but, but like, we were still also tired from yeah. everything we were kind of prepping before. Cause I mean, like this is behind the scenes stuff. Like Matt did a ton of work creating thumbnails and getting everything organized ahead of time. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, he was helping me from having, you know, a, a literal breakdown with the Let's scheduling and the ticket stuff like that. So there was a lot of nah, work. And by the time fine. we got to TIFF, it was, still somewhat exhausting but i do i really love the movie but i yeah. do want to watch it again and and the thing i do agree with you on is that there is a lot to take in because you're yeah. watching a film that is visually so kinetic and and at time i mean this is park chan wook style in general overwhelming that it, that it, yeah yeah it's this kind of collage of imagery and 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 style over substance which is something i really love about his films but it's also there's there, there's so much backstory and exposition in terms of building the key or the central relationship between this detective and quasi femme fatale type. And so, you know, you're, you're getting backstory of, you know, the, the Chinese character who married a Korean man, who's kind of the the murder victim, quote unquote, of this case. And, you know, you're learning about her story and the national identity of China. and, And there's a lot there to take in. And even though, you know, the, 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 the density of it, is intriguing because you know you'll have a scene where they're in an interrogation room and having you know the the best sushi, the best looking sushi i've sushi ever seen ever um but then also you're getting a ton of exposition where you're having to read and watch at the same time which isn't there's nothing wrong with that i, I totally get it but it is something where i like i feel on a second watch 
I might. It like would probably more, be more yeah. rewarding, and you would probably pick up on a lot more things. Same Definitely. Way that you watch even something like Glass Onion, you know, like the second Absolutely. time around, you 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 see the clues. You know, Mister Policeman, I gave you all the clues. I, I definitely agree with that. So I think maybe being the first movie of the festival, you know, the hype is there of leading in, and then being a little lost throughout it. There are again, I agree that it's it's funny, weirdly funny in moments. Um, I liked some of the use of technology in the movie and, and the performances are good. And again, even at number 23 for me, not a bad movie. Like I still gave it three stars. Like I, I still like found enough there to at least mildly enjoy myself. I just wasn't like over the moon about it. It kind of maybe like even I wasn't as enthusiastic about it as you were um, still didn't you know, and I think we we feel the same about Brother, which is you know lower on our list than maybe some others. Um, the Banshees of Inishirin, um, we do have a review up, so you can get my more nuanced thoughts, thoughts or maybe whatever fucking brain mush I, I put out there that day. Um, I, hey man, I pronounce automobile industries like a crazy person fine. in our barbarian review. So uh, Martin McDonough, one of those guys that is hit or miss for me. And I feel like maybe I'm on the other side of things where I like the movies that most McDonough fans don't like. And the more you know, American yeah, films. Yeah. And, and Banshees maybe on a rewatch knowing exactly what it is with subtitles on not saying that like I, it's just sometimes the irishness of it um um it's irish right yeah yeah, yeah yeah of course yeah um um it kind of lost me in some of the humor maybe and and not understanding exactly what they were saying maybe again tiff brain maybe i'm just like i don't i can't do this right now but like I, um <laughs> that happened a couple of times um not for the movies but just like it's like sometimes you just like you my know, brain's just, playing catch up almost, right? So yeah. like it's very fast talking and and quick witted and and you know thick with accents and it doesn't hold any of that back and I like it for that. But then also my brain is playing catch up to some of it, which is why I think some of the humor might not have worked for me. And I do like its allegory to war. I do like the performances. I think it's beautiful. Um, but I think, and I said this on the review, it's just like it is a hot take for me. But it's just like the humor didn't land with me, which hindered my enjoyment throughout the whole movie. So I can appreciate all of those things. Um, but ultimately in this very subjective list, um, I didn't enjoy it as much as some of these other films because that humor just didn't land with me throughout. So even if some of those more interesting aspects of filmmaking um, are there, uh, I do. That's why I think ultimately, once I think about this, this probably might move up closer to, you know, above Empire of Light or or clo above the Good Nurse and stuff like that. While those are more kind of Empire of Light's a messy ass movie, but it's more straightforward. Um, uh, and Good Nurse, very uh, kind of a, a conventional procedural, but like still thoroughly entertaining. But like Banshees is doing more interesting things than some of the both of those movies, right? So that's why I think eventually I could maybe move that movie up. So I don't think it's like, again, when I call this the good, the bad, and the Bulgari, this isn't a bad thing. It's just for me personally, hot take, it was on a, the lower bit of my list and then i think the other one that i think most people probably won't agree with me is the woman king where i saw it very last film of the festival um and i'll wait till you see it eric and we'll review it so i won't go into like a ton of detail but um you know i think it's an exciting kind of like uh you know popcorn movie at times but then um i feel like there are some like plot elements and just the entire like conventional nature of the whole thing like it's your pretty standard like um feel good crowd pleaser not even feel good crowd pleasing action drama movie that felt so kind of cookie cutter um that it hindered my enjoyment and i thought viola davis like um i she's usually great and I, and she is good in this but there's something about the the accent she does too that dropped in and out where at times i just heard straight up viola davis and then 
other times I heard the character and then that kind of took me out of the movie. And then what I mean by the whole conventional nature of it, it's just like, if you've seen one of those kind of action drama crowd pleaser movies, like it, if you go, what do you usually see in those movies? And then you could make a list of things that usually happen in those movies. And this movie kind of is a checklist of those things. And I just felt like I wish it did something a little you know, more interesting than just that. And, and again, they're called crowd pleasers for a reason, which is why I'm going to be kind of in the minority here of, of people that the crowd pleasing nature of it didn't please me, (laughs) but like, it's not a bad movie. Some of the action sequences are, are, are really solid. Um, I think Lashana Lynch is really great. Um, uh, you know, John Boyega is a lot of fun. Um, the young girl who plays the, the lead, um, I guess Viola is the, the lead, but um, it's almost I would say she's even like co-lead or um, um, oh, what's her name? Oh, Thuso Mabedu um, plays Naoi and um, she's oh, from the excellent. Underground Railroad uh, yeah. the Jenkins series. Yeah, um, the whole cast is is pretty solid. It just fell into this territory where like certain plot elements I kind of rolled my eyes at and just felt like you didn't need to have that in there. You could have done something a little bit more interesting or focused. Um, so again, I gave it three stars. Like it's, it's a totally fine movie, but um, it's just that overly conventional nature of it where I'm like, I kind of wish you guys did something a little bit more interesting or, or, or gritty even like it does go to places like it's violent and, and, and stuff like that, but in emotional at times, like it really violent for, Davis. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, I'm curious to get your thoughts, Eric. Cause like I, it just, it, it, it was okay. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's a shame cause it seems like Viola Davis really like put everything into it from like everything I've seen on it. And um, I mean like, Oh, it just still bothers me. She did not get an Oscar nomination for widows like that. Oh performance. yeah. It's, kills like yeah. it is amazing um but I'm, I'm still excited to see it um i know what you're talking about like it kind of like almost sounds in a lot of ways like braveheart where yes people like, compared it to braveheart and that's kind of the movie well, or gladiator or something yeah like, that. like it's one of those like a like awards baity action drama films that is both trying to be a dramatic representation of a period or a culture or a certain character within the historical confines yeah. of uh, battle or movement that happened and then also it gives the actors you know something to kind of like a, a showiness you know like a, a moment to kind of deliver a great monologue or speech to rile up the troops or something like that you know like i i get what you're saying with, with those in those two comparisons as well so just it's like okay like there's nothing wrong with those i i, I like both um braveheart and and yeah uh, that's what i mean like i don't think like i think just some of that you know, I've seen this movie before. It's just, you're putting a different historical, you know, uh, piece of history, a historical piece of history. That's doesn't make any sense, but you know what I mean? But yeah. like, um, a historical you're, you're, context. Yeah. Uh, to that same kind of movie. And it has all of those moments that you're just like, Oh yeah. Okay. That happens in all of these movies. And you're like, okay. Yeah. That happens in all of these movies. And then there's just one plot point that just really felt so convenient And, you know, Nevis was arguing with me after the movie being like, well, you watch Star Wars and blah, 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 with all this fake shit and whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but I know that aliens don't exist and that you can't travel. This is supposed to be reality. So when something so convenient happens, it pulls me out of the movie. And I know there's suspension of disbelief and you wouldn't have a movie if you didn't have these you kind of things happen for the most part. But a lot of the stuff. Where I was. That's why it's called historical fiction, though, as well, right? Absolutely, dude. But. I still think that some things can be overly written to the point of being like, you probably didn't need to make that a plot point or you didn't need to include this in the movie. And you still would have had like an exciting, you know, action crowd pleaser. Like, I feel like, you know, you're trying to give it a little bit more emotion by having these, I, I'm tr- I'm tiptoeing around it, but like, there's just, it feels overly written at times. And then that was kind of my- Overly um, rot. Yes. Um, yeah. Is that the proper term? Or, well, no, overly both, written's fine, yeah. but 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 uh, overwrought is kind of like a, like a, a term fancier in terms term. of being, yeah, overwritten. <laughs> it's a lot of like 
playwrights will, will use that, yeah, but also yeah. like literary I ain't no, I ain't no playwright. Um, <laughs> anyways, I, so Woman King, again, not a bad movie. It's just, uh, I think at that point, being my 33rd film of the festival too, um, I was just kind of like, you really had to kind of win me over here. And it just, it, it, it was fine. Um, right. So that was, I think, maybe my hottest takes um, of the festival. Um, so hot. The opening night movie, The Swimmers, you guys can listen to our review as well, um, was ended up being like, again, 30 and above here, I I at least gave three stars. So even though I'm maybe sounding more critical on a lot of these, I do think overall the festival um, was, you know, pretty good. Like, that's a good batting average. Yeah, I, I, I think like, again, you know there are we talked about it expectations going into a movie and and there are some films that you know you want to revisit based on you know the 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 tiff brain or the festival brain or what have you and 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 give it its best shot because sometimes when you are seeing you know two to three or even more movies a day and you see something that is maybe slower and more methodical in its pacing or in its tone compared to something that is more action-packed and more streamlined if if you go from you know the the woman king to one fine morning or something like that you know like you you have to kind of buffer yourself in that way and and prepare for like okay like that kind of like whiplash where it's like you're going from one kind of extreme or style of filmmaking to another part of the world and learning how you know this kind of movie making is done there and and how things kind of play out i i don't have anything in terms of like a hot take per se i i have more disappointments i mean i mentioned triangle of sadness being you know not my favorite of ruben austin's works that i've seen but also kind of hoping that it would be as exciting as it was when it won the palm door and having that kind of influence come in a little bit i think Coriata's broker was one movie that i wanted to love and i didn't like it the way that i did most of his other stuff um broker is one of those movies that is somewhat disjointed uh, i know my dogs are barking so i apologize for that but um you know is is somewhat disjointed even though it has a charismatic lead performance by song kang ho um it's Koreeda's first movie um in korea um after directing the not so great the truth the french movie with julia Binoche and catherine deneuve and ethan hawk which wasn't great either uh in, in, in any way but um yeah it, it wasn't bad i i don't think it was bad i will take a minor coriata over you know a lot of the stuff i see throughout the year but in terms of following it up after something like shoplifters which to me is a near perfect movie in every way this almost felt like a photocopied version of shoplifters with the makeshift family coming together and having a moment and then you know trying to figure out what the next step is and whether or not they can stay together and 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 being a road trip movie as well there's always that gamble of it being too meandering and too aimless in its uh uh style of of hangout uh movie but yeah it it was fine it was well made it i i was with it till the end but it just didn't have that impact that so many of of his other films have had and and having someone like song kang ho who you know, is one of the most charming and charismatic leading men, you know, working today and won the acting, uh, the, the, the male acting prize at, at Cannes. Um, it just felt like I wanted more from it than, than it gave me. But then again, that's also playing part of it. expectations. Like I'm, I shouldn't expect anything than what the movie is, um, you know, and that was kind of disappointing a little bit uh, for me, um, a movie that we both were kind of, I think, mostly negative on that some people did seem to really like was devotion which you know yeah. has two great actors kind of on on the rise right now with jonathan majors and glenn powell but you know riding off the the coattails a little bit of top gun maverick not just with glenn powell in it but also having a key moment in devotion being very similar to um, a sequence in Top Gun Maverick, I think kind of hurt it. And the material never engages you in a way, you know, I said like for an inspirational story, it's pretty uninspired in terms of its filmmaking. And I've liked that director's other stuff before. I think Sweetheart is a really fun little creature feature. Um, and it just, yeah, it was, it was never a movie that engaged me on 
either the dramatic side or on the technical awe of some of the aerial sequences. It just kind of felt, you know, pretty much one note throughout the entire film to the point where like it does overstay its welcome and doesn't really get across what it's trying to portray other than telling you what it's doing. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Uh, pretty one note and, and extremely conventional. And, you know, I think maybe that's just a pet peeve of both of us, like those cookie cutter kind of movies. You just want something a little bit more from them, even though you have two really likable leads. And I do think it hurts the movie coming out after Top Gun, even though they're two different, completely different movies trying to accomplish completely different things. But, you know, it coming out in the same year is just uh, unfortunate, I think, for yeah. for devotion and having Glenn Powell, who was also in Top Gun. So the, the comparisons will be there, even though those two movies probably shouldn't even be compared, but no, you still... again, historical fiction versus, yeah. you know, a, a pure a popcorn prop, entertainment. Pop, like, yeah. I was going to say pop pop again, <laughs> prop, propaganda, popcorn movie yeah. making. You yeah. Know? Like that's it's, 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 it's it, yeah, it's, it's, it's apples and oranges, but it's still within, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, naval kind of structure of, of one of those movies. But it, it also shows you how the mechanics of something like Top Gun Maverick, works so well um, yeah. to engage you for those two hours and i think devotion could have done that and 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 still been historically representative of what it's talking about you know and 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 it just yeah it's just unfortunate that a movie like that failed and 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 again like i almost do want to rewatch it not because i i think my opinion would change too much but because i feel like we saw a version of it that wasn't properly equipped with the IMAX theater um, having I, a problem. I think that's a great you know pivot for this section of if we're doing the good the bad and the bulgari for the bad part of tiff i think you know yeah you don't really have any the bad part of yeah ticket master that was a huge thing you can listen to our that (laughs) from the preview episode because like we go into all those details i think you're you the whale being at 31 a little bit of a hot take but i know we both but it's um, the performance that is so good and and i think like the movie i appreciate darren aronofsky doing something that is a little bit more restrained for yeah, him. Yeah, I said the and, same thing. Yeah. And and also something that is still in his wheelhouse. Like he seems to have... <laughs> so yeah, so with The Whale, I, I guess my ramblings were that Darren Aronofsky, you know, very much is attracted to protagonists that are kind of circling the drain that need a moment of redemption or enlightenment to, you know, further kind of inspire them or move them to a place that they feel that they can continue their life or this is like their final shot at something and you know randy the ram robinson is is very much you know akin to that uh, natalie portman's character in black swan um ellen burston and requiem for a dream like they're they're all very much of uh, a a similar kind of uh sort of depiction and development of character throughout aronofsky's filmography yeah um, i agree the performance Noah, is better than you know uh, the performance is better than the movie but um yeah. and the performance uh, is really good it's just that it's one of those things where like I, I was hoping that the movie would be as transcendent as the performance and the performance in those last 10 minutes really do prove that like you know brendan Fraser has done good work before you know quiet american school ties um, you know, movies like that, but this really kind of shows, and like even more recently with Steven Soderbergh's No Sudden Move, that he really does have something. And, you know, this performance is, is like, he just puts every thing into it and, and yeah. you can feel that, you know? Absolutely agree. Um, continuing on what you were saying uh, right before this with the projection in Scotiabank 12, if we're talking about the bad uh, of tiff if that's what this segment is called um yeah some of the projection issues at scotia bank um continue to happen and you know if you are longtime listeners uh or watchers of eric and i uh you know that we're critical of cineplex and especially the scotia bank theater um and what's weird about this whole thing is like yeah some of the worst uh presentation um that i had at tiff 22 was at scotia bank um, I think both in, um, cinema 12 as well as cinema four, 
um, weren't weren't very good. Cinema One, uh, we'll get into that too. So like all their big cinemas, which Cinema Twelve, I usually is the IMAX theater at Scotia Bank in Toronto. Um, we usually like watching movies there because you get to see some weird stuff that you wouldn't normally watch on an IMAX screen, right? So it's always like kind Roost. Of, it's always very interesting to watch. I saw Moonlight on that screen. We saw The Lobster on that screen. I've seen like a lot of big kind of art house movies and stuff like that on that IMAX screen, um, which is always interesting. And it's an IMAX laser projector. And I think they use the IMAX projector for it, even though it's not the IMAX experience, which it reminds you. Um, but there was something off this year in Scotiabank 12 where it felt like uh, the bulb was dimming or, you know, the contrast and, and kind of uh, whether it's HDR or the, the dynamic range, like the blacks in, um, in movies, like anything that took place at night felt like really muddy and dark. And like it, it also happened in cinema four. And I was just like, man, like it's a classic thing that happens at Scotiabank where they just, they won't change their bulbs until like they literally have to so if you get at that tail end of you know the life cycle of one of these projection bulbs like it, it ends up looking like really crappy and it's even more jarring because you go to these screenings at the princess of wales and the uh the rat and and roy thompson hall and because they're all these new systems that they put in specifically for the festival, so Mr. Christie comes in and, and you know, he puts in... Make uh, some good cookies. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. Um, he Bad comes mustard, in though. and puts... Uh, he makes mustard, too? No, he's making a joke. Okay. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> Mr. I Christie's mustard. <laughs> I'm like, with these companies, man, like, Kraft makes everything. So, yeah. Um, so those new systems that they put in and speakers they put in for these... Um, uh, you know, cinemas that aren't usually equipped to play movies, it's so good. You're spoiled because there's proper masking, no matter what format the movie's in four by three, uh, two, three, nine, one, eight, five, it's going to be properly masked and it's going to sound and look incredible because they put in a new projector, which probably has a brand new bulb and, um, and they make sure and test those cinemas to be like, those are where the movies are premiering, right? So they're going to make sure that experience is that TIFF experience. And then when you hand it over to Cineplex and Scotiabank, you're getting probably that I'm sure they do testing and, you know, minor testing to make sure everything works properly, but it's the same kind of testing you would get if you saw a movie there on a Saturday afternoon, right? Like I, you know, it did, did sound like they cranked up the sound of fucking 25 in cinema one where yeah. my eardrums hurt during a fucking Mia Hansen love movie where I'm well, like, also all the ads, right? Yeah. Which there's the one RBC ad where the guy's reenacting Pulp Fiction and in he's the screaming <laughs> and, it's and just he's like... basically doing his version of Ryan Reynolds. Um, yeah, it, it, it like that that theater for that screening and then i saw eternal daughter in there the next day it was so loud it felt like it pierced my ears yeah, at times it hurt my ears at times and um so with the sound issues in cinema 1 the projection issues in cinema 12 and cinema 4 uh cinema 2 was probably the best scotiabank cinema to be honest um i felt like the projection was the decent AVX. Yeah, the AVX theater. The projection was decent and the sound was loud, but like a good loud. That's where I saw Pipeline. I saw a lot of movies in Cinema 2. Um, I thought Cinema 2 was okay, but I think it's just one of those things that whether TIFF needs to step in and maybe do a little bit more quality control before the festival there, like they do with the other venues or something like that. I don't know if they rely too much on the managers and stuff. Not saying that the managers don't care because a lot of the times – you know, I know from working there, it's been a while, but like, you know, they can only do so much, right? Like if they request to replace bulbs and their bosses go, well, don't change them until you literally have to, because it's a cost saving thing and, and stuff like that. Like, you know, and also proper masking. That's something Eric and I talk about all the time where, you know, it doesn't bother me in the IMAX theater because the screen's so gigantic, but like any of those other theaters, um, you kind of just wish they still had that or put a little bit of effort into that kind of stuff. So um, that's why I always tell people, like, try to see movies at those other venues because you can see a movie at Scotiabank any day of the week for the entire year. So, um, And the escalators are usually working at those hey, points they too. They are now, yeah. They worked all festival, which is yeah. impressive. So, 
that's, that's where kind they put, of... that's where tiff put all the emphasis on it was like we either we either look at uh the screenings and and or the, the escalators or the escalators let's let's work we're, on the escalators i know um so also like, what's kind of gross as well is is just seeing like and this isn't tiff's fault or anything but like seeing like all those like garbage cans and like those just like piled with like food outside and of the theater and, yeah. yeah yeah i know that's the city's problem that yeah. i'm changing those because they 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 don't plan for this influx of people right so right. um they don't change the schedules of when those things are getting changed but going back to scotia um yeah my suggestion to people when you're planning for the festival like and especially when i'm doing you know my schedule and eric's and and stuff when we're planning is like i didn't do it this year because like i think we opted to go mostly public and tried to go to a lot of premieres because those were before the first pni um but in future you know I'll, i'll probably balance it out but like movies that are in 185 i don't mind seeing at scotia because they're screens are 185 screens so they are technically properly masked because that's what the size of their screens are if you see anything in 239 widescreen um those are best to see at those other venues because they properly mask them and the projection is fantastic where i find the 185 movies at the makeshift venues the screen is a little bit smaller so it it just doesn't fit the venue as well because they're almost built as two, three, nine screens, but they're, they shrink the screen for the one, eight, five movies. So I find the one, eight, five movies look better at Scotia because the screens are bigger and you're in a smaller space. So they fit that theater better. Um, Then four by three movies. If you go see that in Scotia 12, which is the IMAX theater, an IMAX screen is going to be closer to a four by three aspect ratio. So that will be wild to watch in in Scotia 12. Um, Or you go see those at one of the other venues that will properly mask. Like we saw the whale. The whale is in four three. It's a 24 movie. They dump truck of money. (laughs) Um, um, That was properly masked at the Royal Alexandra in four three and if you see something at lightbox as well they'll properly mask um everything and of course they're going to do it when someone is there from the cast and crew like if darren aronofsky came out on the stage and it wasn't properly masked i mean i wouldn't be surprised if he refused to play it because it does seem like i mean he knows that it's going to play in multiplexes and 90 percent of the time it's not going to be properly masked so i didn't even mention lightbox because i didn't even see a single movie at lightbox which i always make that mistake because Lightbox is an incredible theater. Um, it's just I can also go year round and see stuff there. But like uh, Lightbox is perfect sound, perfect projection, perfect masking. Like it is, it is a premier top tier theater because they give a shit. I just wish they took the Lightbox people and put them at Scotiabank for just a week before the festival and said, "Hey guys, can you make sure this shit is up to par?" Like it's just it does feel like when you're seeing something at Scotiabank and I hate to be harping on Cineplex and stuff like that too, but like I I just really feel like it's such a premium experience anywhere else and then when I see something at Scotiabank, I'll give you all the credit in the world. Your seats pretty comfortable. Your food options, typical cinema stuff, but I can get a cherry Coke and some M&Ms. I'm thrilled. Um, So like there are pros and cons to everything, but I really just, the quality control people just need to pop over to Cineplex for like a day or two and just make sure that those cinemas are optimized. Well, you think the studios would also kind of be putting some pressure on either tiff or dude i don't think bank at that point because because i i i I know what you're going to say but i and i do agree with you but like in terms of scotia bank the scotia bank theater being kind of the main hub for press and industry you're getting a lot of reviews coming out of tiff and if somebody sees something that you know looks at the cinematography of devotion and says oh it was really muddy and dark looking and i couldn't see half of the time that's not necessarily the film's fault and but, that's still getting reviewed yeah. based on that though i agree and i, just but I also know what you're gonna say and i agree with you on this so. with just like you look at the press screenings that we go to right and they're all at scotia or something like that like i do wish like i know the pr people are just you know they they rent the theater that makes the most sense and a lot of the times it's the scotiabank avx theater or another scotiabank 
uh, theater. I used to be at Young and Dundas a lot and, and stuff too, or Varsity. Um, but like, I almost wish because you, uh, to your point exactly, Eric, with the with your press or the people putting out these official reviews of movies. Um, sure, you could be like, oh, the the plebs that are seeing it at the multiplex on the weekend who gives a shit. But if we want the good reviews, like let's. I, I love when we get an invite where it's like it's screening at Lightbox or it's oh, screening yeah. and like even I will also give a shout out to be nice to Cineplex. Um, the AVX theater at Young and Dundas is dynamite. It's a two three nine uh, widescreen uh, screen. So if you see something like I saw Woman King there and it, it you know it was properly masked on that screen. The seats are incredibly comfortable. Uh, the sound is good. The projection did look a little dim, though, so maybe it's a backhanded compliment. So, uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Like, I don't. If again, if I ever moved, to, say I left this job and took a PR job at a studio, I would be that annoying guy that knows from the other side of things. That would be like, guys, I, I know it costs more money, but we gotta screen our shit at Lightbox. We have to. <laughs> like, we should screen everything in Cinema Two. At Lightbox. I know it might cost a little bit more money. Somehow make some sort of arrangement with TIFF. Like, use this shit in your bargaining. Like, your teams work together of like, hey, this movie played the festival. You got to give us some free fucking press time at the light box like like <laughs> that's like negotiate this shit like it's sports like i'll give you a second round draft pick if you give me uh if you give me this or i'll give you four press screenings at the light box for free if you play this movie um i just like luckily like you know all the netflix stuff screens there and, and different things like that but um and that's not saying i i you know it, it completely i saw a lot of movies at Scotiabank, and you know it didn't affect my experience on everything so it's not you know, and, you know, I have a friend who's a, a manager there and, and who I worked with at Cineplex in Oshawa. And I know Jonathan gives a shit. So it's just like, but I'll also be critical of like, come right. on, like, come on. You guys. can do better and you should be doing better. And not Jonathan specifically, but just no, Cineplex. no, 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 no. The, the, the corporation as yeah. a whole. And like the problem isn't like, OK, well, we have to compete with, you know, other um, forms of entertainment and and things like that by, you know, putting more money in a restaurant or, you know, creating a, a, a game facility of some sort. Like, you need to put the money into making the best theatrical experience possible because ultimately people are going to come to see a movie and not dine at a theater that you've created that's overpriced and has yeah. subpar food, you know? Like, that's, like, the whole point of going to the movies, you know? Yep. It's the experience itself. All right, Eric, uh, that um, let's get into the Bulgari of TIFF 2022. <laughs> uh, specifically, we already made some in jokes about the Bulgari ad, the Christie ad, the Wii poster. Um, what are some other things from the festival that were memorable to you to kind of wrap up uh, this episode? Well, Matt, the thing I have told every person I know in terms of people I care about is um, this was one of the weirdest mornings I had. So the morning that I was doing the press junket for Causeway, I uh, woke up at a, at a decent time. I wasn't running late or anything, um, but I had to be at the St. Regis before 1015 because Apple had booked two levels, uh, one being for um, a COVID test facility. So you go in, you do your a COVID check, then you're cleared if you pass and you go up to the next level, which is all the um, hotel rooms booked for the various films that they have. So I woke up, got ready to go. Um, I dropped my phone at the screening for Decision to Leave because that was the day where I was wearing my shallow, uh, my my pocket, my <laughs> pants with shallow pockets. Eric dropped his phone about four times in the first couple of days of the festival. And all you could hear is, fuck. <laughs> uh or, or jesus um and so it it cracked on the side uh, but it was just the not the phone itself but like the, the screen the lens protector. protector yeah the screen protector and so anyways i'm setting this, that up for later i'm ready to go i'm at my brother's place nobody's there it's just me for for the for the night so i wake up i'm ready a little nervous because it was my first interview in person that i had done in three years um, so I'd had notes. I had kind of gone over with you what I was going to talk about um, the day before. 
and um, got an Uber. As the Uber was coming, uh, a delivery truck literally almost crashed <laughs> into it. Almost and pancaked it was, you? It, yeah, not me. The 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 Uber, mm-hmm. and because they came. Well, you were in the Uber, weren't you? No, no, I wasn't. Oh. I was I was outside of. I was on uh, the the porch waiting for for the Uber to come in, and literally these two vehicles just came in at the same time. We're going for the same spot, and it was just like that kind of halting screech sound that you know is common in a lot of movies and television, where it's just like. Argh! And so then I had to sign for a package for my brother Kyle's partner Heidi and ran back into the house, got into the Uber, got over to um, the St. Regis, uh, got to the testing uh, floor, went in, and um, one of the um, Apple PR people uh, was like, okay, go into this place, and then you'll you'll deal with the, the on-location um, testers. And then they asked me for my ID and things like that, so I went into my pocket, pull that out and as i was doing that i literally sliced open my thumb uh where where the nail was and started bleeding all over the place and they hadn't (laughs) seen it yet um because they were they were checking my id and i said to them do you guys have a first aid kit and they're like why i'm like i cut myself on my phone and they looked at me they're just like how sharp is your phone and i showed them it and they're like oh okay and then you know like they patched me up and and you know, my test COVID test cleared and, you know, we had a good laugh about it that an Apple product, you know, injured me doing an Apple press junket for a film. So literally after that, I'm waiting on the second floor to go to the, the hallway. So that's where they call it. It's like on deck. So you're waiting. So me and a French film critic who I just met like a couple minutes before are both standing in this hallway that if you were to stand side by side, you know, shoulder to shoulder, you would be touching the other side of um, the hallway, like the hallway uh, wall. And so it was so crammed and claustrophobic. And so we're standing with our backs towards uh, the the wall outside of the main room that we're going to be doing the interview with the director of Causeway. She leaves for about 15 minutes because she had just completed um, uh, print interviews uh, or, or like ones that are just kind of like recorded and things like that. She was about to do TV and me and this other guy were the first two up. She leaves for 15 minutes. Um, a Apple PR guy comes up to us like, okay, look, um, we're going to have somebody walk past you in the next 10 minutes or so. And you can say hello to this person um, and they will say hello back, but no photos uh, no other interaction. Uh, please do not try to engage in any conversation and please keep your hands in, uh, the, in, in, you know, your sight of view or eye line. Um, so, and don't make any sudden movements. At this point, what are you thinking? At this point, I don't know what I'm thinking because I'm, I'm like, who could this be? Like, I was thinking, I was thinking it might've been Oprah. Um, because she yeah, was one Oprah of the made on, sense. On, I thought it was maybe Tim Poitier Cook, talk. like from Apple, was there too. <laughs> right. But I was like, would that warrant that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then like as I was telling a couple other people, they were like, oh, is it was that like Jennifer Lawrence or something like that? And I was like, no, no. Um, and so he leaves. Then a guy in a suit comes by and starts passively, aggressively, but not in like a mean way, just kind of like ask probing us. Me and this French film critic questions about like what outlets are we from who we're interviewing what we're doing at the festival what we're seeing today do you know like do we have anything else on us like uh, uh, equipment electronics that kind of thing and you know like it, it felt like we were being asked questions in an interrogation room or you know for a job interview or something it was it was weird and then on this guy's lapel on his jacket he had this emblem, like this circle emblem. And um, the French film critic was like, he looks at me, he's like, I think that's a secret service. <laughs> and then the guy leaves. And then the Apple guy comes back and he's like, okay, you've been cleared. So now I can tell you who's going to be walking by you. It's going to be the secret service and, and Hillary Clinton. And she's going to be walking to the other side of, of this hallway to go into the um, the print press room that's on the other side. So again, you can say hello to her or good morning, and she will respond back to you, but please nothing else. And again, be aware that the Secret Service will be uh, accompanying her. So 
be careful. Mm-hmm. So I was I was nervous with the Secret Service because I'm I'm a, I'm a nervous sure. guy in general and what have you. And so like, yeah, you don't want to be like took, uh, and like yeah. So I took fast. my notebook and put it on <laughs> the chair that was outside of the. Uh, the hallway and just had it there so like i sure. didn't have anything like in my hands like <laughs> sure. as she was walking by and then this cavalcade of secret service guys some of which were wearing their sunglasses Sick. uh which was hilarious came by hillary clinton was in that group she looked at the french uh film critic and you know said good morning he said bonjour and then um, looked at me and said good morning and i said hello to her and then she walked by and then after that was over me and the french guy just looked at each other and was like what the hell just happened <laughs> so that's that's i guess my biggest takeaway from tiff 2022 is just that experience being very surreal starting with an uber and delivery truck almost crashing to me cutting open my finger on an apple iphone to then hillary clinton the former first lady walking by it, it, it was just like one of those mornings where it's like okay you know what i'm not going to stress out about this interview anymore because it's just gotten too <laughs> weird already so I, and then doing the interview i think it went i think it went fine and then you know it was like, great dude I, everyone I call, can go I called, check it out right now i called you afterwards and i called you know my mom and kyle and and things and it was it was just it was just an interesting way to start the day oh I absolutely felt like, dude that's got to like be one of the could most only happen at tiff yeah one of the most famous people you'll ever be in a room with like whatever you feel about hillary clinton's politics or or anything or the reason why she was at tiff or or any of that shit like um that's another conversation but um just it is still a wild thing and just a jarring thing and, and a, a wild story to tell just being like something you're not expecting to happen to you that early in the morning, right yeah. before an interview. And like at that spot, like I knew she had an Apple TV thing and, I, but she was there for something else, right? Like not the Apple, probably TV some thing. sort of press conference um, or something. Yeah. Like she that. was like some... in a conversation and um, yeah, but it w- that is just that that's hilarious and and really random and wild and you were just you know at the I, right place right time but like in a, in just for something weird to happen to you so yeah. um it's uh it's uh that's wild man yeah i don't have any stories like that what's my uh most interesting story that happened at tiff or a person i bumped into or saw didn't really see that many like you know random encounters of like directors or or celebrities this year like you know i guess we didn't spend as much time at the p and i screenings and i feel like we saw you know a lot of directors and actors will um will go to some of those because their badge gets them into them but a lot of them also go to premieres like we saw michael chiklis in the cast of bros at uh the fableman's premiere Finn um, Wolfhard was there. Yeah, Finn um, Wolf- yeah, a lot of people were at the Fableman's premiere. Um, but other than that, like, I don't have any wild stories, you know? Like, uh, for me, it was like, you know, the food we got. We got some good Momofuku, like, ramen uh, one day. We got the cereal like, bar, man. That's um, probably one of my favorite experiences of this whole festival. Never good. had it before. I got to go back uh, and get some chili crunch. I've been. Um, I've been craving they they opened up their shop for some of their momofuku like take home items and the chili crunch it's like garlic onions chili flakes like oil like it I I just want that shit and throw it on everything um but that uh, cereal milk ice cream is is real good um yeah milk bar is great uh we got some good pizza at times we actually ate pretty well like we we jumped around and had uh different things and tried to have some vegetables at some point and um but because i ate better this year than maybe i did in previous years still ate like garbage a lot of oh the visa infinite lounge i guess was like the big thing which i mentioned earlier in the episode but like um is something that i hadn't experienced before i know they've had the visa infinite lounge forever but i'm like oh this shit rules i'm like this is, um <laughs> you can't so go like, back now yeah i was like this is awesome as long as you like you get there early enough and get in is like i i maybe wish there was like another food option that i could even buy from in there because you're there an hour and a half before a movie um 
So. Yeah, they only have popcorn and some in some cases Lindor, um, which is fun. Oh, I ate and, so many Lindor chocolates, and they're horrible for you. They're just like yeah. oil and fat and like uh, decadent, fucking rich um chocolates and i ate you know i edited some podcasts from the visa infinite lounge so shout out to that um but i had a t- uh, the uh, the uh, the iced tea as well uh during gold that leaf got to shout out all yeah. the sponsors yeah um i don't think there was, was there any other like stories i'm missing of um I mean, we talked to people that we ran into, you know, whether we went to the press office or we were headed to a movie or something like that. So we saw a lot of people and it was nice talking to everybody and, and, and having that. As I have well, other so. funny stories, but they're like some of like, I'm sure the person wouldn't care if I told this story, but I haven't asked him I know yet. The story so like, you're, you're I'm not about. going to tell that. You I should have, him, I should have no. asked him first. Beforehand. But, yeah. Um, but that was maybe funny. get him, maybe get him on the show. Yeah, and yeah. We can, we can Cause I don't, I don't, I haven't even talked to him about that. Um, I I did. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah, It was. That's funny. I'll talk to you after about it. But that's really funny. I know I'm being weirdly um, cryptic, cryptic, but vague. um, But that's the thing, though. It's like like, there are so many times where it's like there are person. I mean, your life is still going on as well outside of the festival in terms of just you know having to take care of certain things as well or, or, or keep updated on on what's going on. That you know you, you you have to kind of take that into consideration. Uh, as much as as doing the, the the festival beat in general you know like it's it's a lot of fun and like there's you know like i made the joke the the day when i picked up my pass like adam agoyan was there and like, yeah you know, it's it's not you a festival way more until celebrity you, encounters than i yeah have. until you see adam agoyan picking up his pass and asking somebody uh what, what movies, movies are playing <laughs> <laughs> like adam man just you gotta do a little research bro um i'll gladly put your schedule together just hit me up um but yeah, man, it was a blast. I love TIFF. Uh, I can't wait for next year. Counting down the days for TIFF 2023. I know we always leave this uh, with some predictions for next year, Eric. I didn't listen to what we predicted for this year. I'm sure we had some pie in the sky kind of uh, ideas of what would play the festival. Were we right about any of it? I don't know. Did we say Spielberg might be there? I don't think um, so. Spielberg's one of those guys where it's like that does seem like a left field kind of choice. So uh, if you if were going to predict anything for next year, have you even like thought about it at all of like <sighs> what's coming next year that um, Matt, I don't know. I mean, what's been delayed this year that seems like it would be like a prestigious. Well, we film. said Killers of the Flower Moon will be that one movie that we think like everyone all festivals will, be will trying want. to get right. And I, yeah. I think the Spielberg thing is interesting because um it kind of kicks the door down for like anything can happen like i don't know if i would have said like spielberg's next movie would play tiff as a world premiere right so i think with that like i guess the other things are like you know we don't get many like huge blockbusters like you're not going to see a marvel movie play tiff i mean never say never but like i think joker 2 we haven't even talked about all the people's joker stuff but we don't really have like neither of us saw the movie it only had the one screening um you know vera drew's working through some legal issues with that i think it still might be playing fantastic fest but i'm not 100 percent sure but then ironically for people who don't know the because of rights issues the following it played midnight madness but then the rest of the screenings got canceled for the people's joker um Ironically, I think Joker 2 will probably play the festival next year, which is almost even a bigger kick to the face of of the People's Joker this year. Um, If I'm going to just kind of go, oh, this makes sense of what will play TIFF. But maybe Warner Brothers doesn't take it to TIFF because of all of this too, right? Like, I don't know. Um, That's also um, a possibility. I think the film for me that I wouldn't be surprised, depending on again like when it gets released theatrically is uh the film that we've had on our most anticipated list now i think for twice. seven years uh, only twice uh is jonathan glazer's the zone of interest which is based mm-hmm. on the martin amos uh novel or loosely based on the martin amos novel and he's a filmmaker that does take his time to really put together um a movie so if it's ready for next year i wouldn't be surprised if it did hit the festival circuit because under the skin 
hit quite a few um, festivals and like it just seems kind of primed for a fall or maybe even can. I don't know. I mean, there's even stuff that you have to consider. It's like, OK, like what is going to be ready for can and what is going to be ready, you know, after the summer, like what's shooting now or what is still in post-production? Because something even like, you know, Wes Anderson's next movie, Asteroid City, seems like it'd be a sure bet for can. And then depending on its theatrical release, maybe it does one festival like the French Dispatch did where it played, I believe it played New York. So that, that's another thing where Killers of the Flower Moon being an Apple Paramount mm. co-collab could end up being an exclusive to one festival. And if it were, it would probably be uh, New York in the same way that like something like the tragedy of Macbeth was yeah. an Apple A twenty four release. Apple did only... bring a lot to TIFF this year, though. Yeah, but but tragedy of Macbeth was New York, and then on the rocks was also New York only. So interesting. Yeah, I mean, just stuff. It, it's hard because, like Eric mentioned, like anything you might talk about will be filmmakers who are either in post production right now or or working through their films right now. So they. It's stuff without release dates, right? Like next year's still looking pretty open because only the major films have release dates. So if you even look at the stuff that comes out in October, November, December of next year, um, like you have something, you know, starting in September, I don't think anything that's dated would play. I mean, weirdly, you have Equalizer 3 and the Equalizer did play. <laughs> tiff i forgot about that Classic. um uh but then into october like craven's not gonna play you might get gareth edwards true love i don't know like that's with john david washington um i, I have no idea what that movie exactly oh, um the one movie that might play is uh the next film from rose glass with uh Kristen stewart which is also an a24 about uh in the world of bodybuilding I cool. think it's first love bleeding or first like it just like because she directed Saint Maud, right? Yeah. And so it seems like that would be a festival film as well. You so. gotta think Dune Part Two has a good shot. Yeah. Um you have to think that that Joker two, play. Dune two. It'll just be twenty nineteen over again, right? Or twenty nineteen? Yeah. Twenty twenty. Yeah. Twenty twenty. 2020. 2020. Yeah, it was yeah. twenty twenty because it was during the pandemic. Um yeah, there's a new Saw movie coming out, Midnight Madness, Peter. Come on. No. <laughs> the David Gordon Green's Exorcist movie, that probably has a better shot than uh yeah. than a Although Saw that movie. is doing a day and date release with Peacock in the US, which is kind of um, That hasn't stopped uh, them from Oh no, no, anything. I'm not saying it would. It's just it's it's fascinating that that Universal and Peacock don't mm -hmm. maybe have the same confidence in this and maybe part of that as well is that David Gordon Green's kind of like burnt himself out on the Halloween stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you have the new adaptation of The Color Purple um, coming from Warner Brothers and Amblin. You almost um, got to look at like either actors or directors or writers. Who have been at the festival. or Yeah, or who have stuff that's coming up in the next year or so that's in production or in post-production now that could possibly end up being there but then there's yeah. also surprises right like something like biosphere was like a last minute edition where like nobody really, really knew, knew anything about it what it was not that it broke out or anything but like there were those stragglers as well that you could never really predict oh yeah i'm just looking at stuff that has released dates which is so limited right i don't i off the top of my head you're better at that stuff of like who is working on something right now like i you know, it's it's just fun to kind of go in and we'll but see even my kinda... brain's fried right now with some of that stuff where it's like <clears throat> Okay, like I'm, I'm just thinking of the more immediate future. It's like, okay, we we still have you know Todd a Todd Field movie to see. Mm -hmm. We still have you know a Luca Guadagnino movie. You know, there's still a lot of stuff left for this year to watch oh, totally, that didn't yeah. play the festival, which is also where I felt to have that conversation. Where I felt last year we pretty much were covered. <laughs> like, yeah, I felt last year we saw everything. Where when it came to award season, I was like, I saw everything at TIFF. Like I, where this year, some of it is coming up immediately, like in the next couple of weeks, but I would say even, you know, later this year, we still have some stuff to kind of get in. Emerald Fennell has a movie that she's shooting right now, or maybe she's in post-production, uh, Saltburn, um, that I think Amazon picked up. So that I wouldn't be surprised if it played the festival circuit, if it's ready in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, let me look at Oscars 2024 predictions. Has anyone started this yet? <laughs> no one's gone that far yet. Come on, man. Um, and if you're if 
you got to do like 2024 to 2025 or something like that because it's like this year it'd be some random person on reddit two months ago from the username the one and only zero three nine three uh from the reddit channel oscar race put 2024 oscar predictions i have no idea but this is kind of fun to look at so we're gonna go through eric so they have uh the color purple dune part two joker falle de uh lee um i don't know what lee is um maestro oh that's Um, the bradley cooper um oh what's his name why am i blank uh uh bernstein leonard bernstein biopic that is going to be a big oscar movie a hot Um, a hot one may december uh, oh, that's Todd. That's Todd Haynes's movie with uh, Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman. Thank God you're here. Um, Killers of the Flower Moon. I know that one. Oppenheimer. I know that one, which is coming out in July. Um, Poor Things and Saltburn. Yeah, um, Poor Things. So Poor Things is a movie that got delayed this year because it wasn't ready in time. So Yorgos Lanthimos's next movie could very well play Can first, um, and it's a searchlight film. So it might be ready then because killing of a sacred deer did play uh can previously. And I think some of his other stuff as well. And his other stuff has played the fall festival circuit. So that's definitely one that will be, um, you know, probably a hot ticket movie for uh, some movies. I didn't mention for best actor. They have Coleman Domingo and Rustin. That um, was supposed to come out this year, but then Netflix delayed it until next. Yeah. Which is a shame because the best actor category is this a little year weak. pretty yeah. weak. And I think like a performance like that, whether the film is good or not, he always seems to yeah. deliver. So they also have John David Washington in the piano lesson. So that's another one. Oh, that's based um, on the uh August Wilson uh play. Thank God you're here. Um uh Annette Benning and Nyad. Nyad um kate winslet and lee we already mentioned lee um i'm only mentioning mentioning is it the kate movies. winslet or is it or yeah you said kate winslet right yeah okay because i was thinking um, you were saying kate blanchett because i no. don't know what lee is but i did hear that they had to or they just started production again because she was injured on set or something oh interesting okay um i'm looking through if there's any other movies in the acting they have they're using a lot of the same movies but that's fine um best original screenplay asteroid city which is the uh, wes, anderson. wes anderson you mentioned already lee maestro may december saltburn poor things they, they're best animated feature super mario baby <laughs> but that's coming out in like march um, best picture of 2024 i fucking hope so man i hope so so that's that's an interesting look shout out to the one and only zero three nine three on reddit um Classic. who the hell knows but those are some very early uh oscars predictions so maybe you know the tiff does like to kind of find those movies that will go on to uh uh to do that so anyways thank you uh another beefy episode we're back baby um uh, beefy boys uh, i hope you guys enjoyed this uh eric and i are exhausted but we will continue uh reviewing things and and talking about movies so all of our tiff content will be over on untitled movie reviews um all of our interviews and different things will be on this channel untitled movie podcast one stop shop for everything is untitled underscore movies over on letterbox we have a andor review out right now for the first four episodes which you guys can check out uh, eric mentioned those interviews with zach Kreger, uh the director of barbarian uh, Lila Nugabauer, who is the director of Causeway, uh, as well as Anu Valia, who is one of the directors of She-Hulk. So go check out those interviews. Eric and I are trying to do more interviews, even though it gives us both anxiety attacks. <laughs> but like, um, but we are trying to kind of open up and do them more often, so that way we um, we have some variety in in our content over on that channel. And we do like talking to people. It's just the build up to that um anything else i need to plug family feud canada on cbc and cbc gem uh monday through thursday at 7 30 p.m um you can check out some of my questions that i uh that i uh, written wrote that i wrote, wrote that i wrote, wrote, for that. wrote my brain is gone um <laughs> uh go check that out uh, as well as you know all my other work around the internet and follow me on all those social medias at matt Rohrbeck. 
And I'm Eric Marchin. You can find more of my video reviews and uh, interviews on rogerstv.com slash cinemascene. Uh, there is a episode coming up with Matt and I doing this, but except it's more truncated. It's and... 20 minutes instead of two hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, and, and cleaner with less profanity um, or no profanity because we can't have profanity on rogers um but yeah so if if you want to see more of us you can go over again to rogerstv.com slash cinema scene and then um on the social media is at em6211 another thing that might happen uh when does the last of us season three start or season one start season three i'm pretty jumped january or february because i was gonna say if it wasn't until later next year that might have been something that played oh i would love that i would love it but it'll probably I could see a South by Southwest uh, for Last of Us as well. Like, say it comes out late March. Uh, right. But the rumors are that it might even be January or February. Um, I don't know if Sundance would do it, but who no, knows? I don't think so. It sounds like a South by Southwest thing because, like, Joel is from Texas. Like, uh, right. that, that would make sense to me. And they've done a lot of TV premieres. But, uh, oh, I'll be talking about The Last of Us. You guys can go check out my Last of Us Part 1 conversation and review with eric um and i wanted it to play prime time so badly but i think um it might have if it came out november december but i think because it's january february it just says 2023 it could be march or april too but i don't know it's a big right. ass show game of thrones though uh hot d i'm enjoying it i know we're i know we're wrapping. i gotta catch we're up the... on that in the bear so oh, like the that's the, that's so the good. other thing where like it's like now i can finally catch up on stuff that i missed at like dragon ball dude i'm August. i'm on the cell game saga baby let's go i'm watching history of trunks right after this um so anyways <laughs> for stop. the promo for the next episode yeah we'll talk about all of that next week all right everyone until next time for the love of film god damn it